Hi, this is Melanie with Michael Rayner, author of The Innovator Solution and The Strategy Paradox. Welcome to I Innovate. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so let's just jump right in with the basics. Your new book is entitled The Strategy Paradox. What exactly is this paradox all about? Sure. The Strategy Paradox is um, a term of coin to try and capture the observation that uh, it seemed to me that many companies pursued what appeared to be absolutely brilliant strategies and implemented them absolutely brilliantly and nevertheless failed. Now, nobody ever said great strategy was a guarantee of success, but it seemed to me that in many instances these companies were in fact failing not in spite of their great strategies, but oddly enough because of their brilliant strategies. And so upon further investigation, it turned out that yes, in fact, precisely the same behaviors that are systematically associated with outsized success are also systematically associated with an increased degree of total failure. In other words, the opposite of success is not failure, it's mediocrity, at least when it comes to the strategic behaviors involved. Companies that fail completely and companies that succeed brilliantly have a lot more in common than we'd care to commit than we than we care to admit. And so the strategy paradox is is an attempt to really encapsulate that somewhat counterintuitive finding uh, in a single tagline. Now, some folks may hear this and think, hey, wait a minute, that sounds suspiciously like a trade-off between risk and return and gold star for you because that's exactly right. Uh, in the finance world, risk and return have been seen as kissing cousins for a long time, but in the strategy world, it's been largely ignored as nearly as I can tell. You go to the business bookshelf and you look at any book that it purports to provide strategic advice, and almost always the sometimes explicit claim is that the increased returns they promise can be had essentially for free that you simply accept their advice, you have a bold vision of the future, you have a strongly differentiated strategic position, you get the right people on the bus, and that you will be able to deliver the returns that you seek, and in fact, sometimes at lower risk. But it turns out that the state of management art and science as we find it today would suggest in fact the opposite. You also introduce a new principle called requisite uncertainty. What's this? Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Part of the uh, research that we've done was able to demonstrate that most organizations, when left to their own devices, most operating businesses that are actually responsible for a competitive strategy in a particular product market, forced to manage the trade-off between risk and return, they systematically choose lower risk, lower return positions. They essentially forego any chance at greatness in exchange for an opportunity to simply survive. Um, that's not a pathology necessarily, it's simply the choice that most people choose to make. We tend to be risk averse, it's a well established principle of, of human psychology. The opportunity I think lies in making it possible for companies to actually achieve higher returns at the same or lower risk, that's the promise of, of, of the book. And that requires I think a new way of separating roles and responsibilities within a hierarchy. There's an organizational psychologist named Elliot Jacks, he passed away in 2003, and he spent about 50 years of his career working largely in the UK on questions of hierarchy and, and organizational design. And what he discovered is that hierarchies work best when the different levels, the different layers in a hierarchy are separated by the time horizons associated with the decisions they make. He called that principle requisite organization. And he said that hierarchies function well when there are these clear separations, clear delineations um, with respect to time horizons. Now, Jax was stuck in a paradigm of strategy as commitment, the notion that organizations, in order to be strategically successful, had to commit. Uh, I take a different view. I think that it's important for companies to explicitly understand and attempt to manage the uncertainty they face. Now, strategic uncertainty in particular has the characteristic of increasing with time, so that the farther you look out, the greater the degree of strategic uncertainty is going to impinge on the choices that you make. As a result, people at the lowest level of the organization, in the hierarchy, people are actually at the front lines working with customers, uh, have relatively short time horizons and consequently very little strategic uncertainty to worry about. And if you're trying to get the new cinnamon flavored toothpaste out the door, you don't wring your hands and wonder whether we should be in medical devices, right? I mean, you've got a plan to make. As you come up a level to the business unit that's responsible for oral health care, for example, now you're making specific strategic commitments. Are we going to be a low-cost leader? Are we going to be a product differentiator and base our success on the strength of our brand, for example? So there's a longer time period there, two to five years, and, but you have to commit despite the uncertainty that you face. And finally, at the corporate level, you're looking at 10 years and more, and now you are looking at long-term strategic uncertainty. So. 
separating out the roles and responsibilities in the hierarchy according to time horizons and the strategic uncertainty associated with that is what leads me to coin the phrase requisite uncertainty as a design principle for actually making it possible for companies to begin to break the risk-return trade-off. So that's the principle of requisite uncertainty. Now you also introduce a tool called strategic flexibility. Sure. Well, requisite uncertainty as a design principle, I think, is an important first step, but now we need to provide a toolkit to actually make it possible for people at the corporate level to begin to manage strategic uncertainty. So what might that toolkit look like? That's what strategic flexibility is an attempt to provide. It uh, can be four phases, and some of these tools, in fact, have been around for a long time. My hope is that by combining them in this way within the context of requisite uncertainty, it makes it possible to create something that, uh, that adds a new, a new dimension of value. It begins with what I call the anticipate phase. The idea here is that since the future is uncertain, it's somewhat foolhardy to try and have some bold, compelling vision of the future that's going to inform all organizational action. Uh, that seems hubris in the extreme. But we can't just throw up our hands and say we have no idea what's going to happen next. And we can, in fact, say something intelligent about the future, even if we can't predict it with any meaningful accuracy. So the anticipate phase draws from the field of scenario-based planning, essentially building a set of stories that describe what I call the boundary conditions of the future. Not predictions as much as they are the limits of what we, we are willing to accept as, as plausible. The second phase is what we call the formulate phase. That is to say, given that this is where the future might lie, that these are the boundary conditions of five or ten years hence, what kinds of strategies would we have to have in place then in order to be successful under those conditions? Then that leads to the accumulate phase. You'll have a series of operating divisions that are in fact committed to specific strategies today that are playing out over two, five, seven years, whatever the relevant time horizon is. And those strategies will have to be meaningfully different in order to be successful under a range of possible different future scenarios. So the accumulate phase essentially leaves it to the corporate office to begin to create what we call a portfolio of strategic options, that is to say a set of assets or capabilities that make it possible for existing operating divisions to change their strategies in ways that they could never do if left solely to their own devices. Phase four is the operate phase, which essentially means running this portfolio of real options, exercising some options as they come into the money, abandoning others as they fall out of the money, and preserving still others when in fact the scenarios with which they are associated remain sufficiently plausible. So anticipate, formulate, accumulate, operate are the four phases of strategic flexibility. So many people have been highly critical <coughs> of Microsoft's ex execution as well as approach. Your book takes a different view on that. Can you please explain? Sure. I think Microsoft is one of, and perhaps, you know, as I can tell at least, maybe the only company that I think has uh, evidence behavior that's fully consistent with this notion that although there is a need to make commitments in strategy, there's uh, similarly a need to understand that the future is uncertain and then one needs to, one needs to create strategic options. I'm not the first one to make this observation, by the way. Um, uh, Eric Beinhacker in his book The Origin of Wealth tells the story of having been at the uh, Comdex Computer Show in 1988 in Las Vegas and looking at all the various uh, um, booths that the different computer companies had set up. And each of these booths were remarkable for how narcissistic they were. Right? He would sort of describe a future five years hence when everybody would be using all and only their products. And the Microsoft booth really was a horse of a different color because there they had part of the booth was given over to MS-DOS, they had uh, their, uh, their collaboration with IBM on OS2, they had their own version of Unix underway, and they were creating applications for Apple. Right? So there's not a lot of evidence of vision or commitment or focus or any of the things that we normally associate with successful strategy. What Microsoft was doing, I think, was essentially creating a portfolio of real options. They had a notion that they were committed to a specific product market. Right? There's no Korean shipbuilding in the portfolio just in case that whole information economy thing didn't work out. So this was not willy-nilly diversification. But by the same token, they understand that, understood that there were significant strategic uncertainties with respect to how you needed to look in order to succeed. Now it turns out that the option that came into the money was the integration of a graph of their own graphical user operating system, which was Windows, with the applications that they had learned how to write for the Apple OS platform. And so by exercising that option, they created the, uh, um, the franchise that, that has been the source of much of the company's success over the last 20 plus years, right? The Windows operating system and Microsoft Office. So when you look at the company today, they, in, in my view at least, are, are, are showing evidence of much of the same type of approach. 
And they have their established OS uh, division that is uh, the core of the franchise. It was enormously successful. It would be hard to dispute that. But what, in fact, the requisite uh, assets and capabilities are to remain successful in the OS business, I think, are quite uncertain. So will the next computing platform be mobile devices? Well, there's Windows Mobile. Will they be uh, the game platform? Well, they've got, micro, they've got Microsoft's Xbox. What about online services? Well, they've got MSN. Uh, what about content? Well, they've got their joint venture with MSNBC and others. Now, they haven't covered every, uh, every bet. I mean, the, the best way to lose all your money is to go to the roulette table and cover every number. Right? And so Microsoft, I think, has both shown a willingness to create a portfolio of options and at the same time, uh, material restraint. Right? They, they had billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars in cash, much of which, in fact, they've, they've given back to the shareholders. It's not as though they went out and bought everything that they could. Right? They, they, they hedged those bets that they felt were worth hedging, I think. So some people will look at Microsoft and say, but wait a minute, you know, they're not nearly as powerful as Google in search. Well, that's true. Nobody's as powerful as Google in search right now. It's a really hard business to dominate. Uh, remember AltaVista? Remember WebCrawler? I mean, there were lots of folks that have taken a swing at this. Uh, Google was the one company that made a big bet, and it, it came up heads for them. So congratulations. Uh, just because you got lucky doesn't mean you don't get to keep the money, so that's fine. Um, but I think to, to look at Microsoft and say, hey, wait a minute, they're not number one in everything, kind of misses the point. Uh, a lot of the businesses that they're in, I think, have not merely what I'll call growth option value, that is to say the opportunity to actually grow and to become a successful business in their own rights, which I think each of these businesses do. But at the same time, they create strategic option value, that is to say an ability to fundamentally re-vector the way they compete in the operating system business without diluting the focus of the operating system division on what they need to do now to make their current commitment successful. Going off on that, what are your thoughts on Google? What are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? And what companies do you think really get innovation? Now, I think Google is uh, um, difficult to say they've come out of nowhere. I mean, they have been around for a while after all, and certainly now they, uh, it's hard to treat them as a startup anymore. And I think they're doing a lot of things right. They're experimenting widely, trying a lot of different things, attempting to leverage their, uh, their, uh, their strength in search in a variety of different directions. Um, what I don't know enough to say with any real certainty, but what I would hope is the case, is that they're not merely looking, as I said before, uh, for alternative growth opportunities. You want to do at least that, but I think you need to do more than that, which is to think carefully about how the strategic landscape might change in ways that actually alter the nature of the value that search can provide. So when you think about search, for example, in mobile telecommunications, there's an opportunity there to fundamentally change this, the, the requisite strategy in the mobile uh, telecommunications space. And mobile telephony has historically been, a, 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 you know, you get a handset from a mobile provider and you buy airtime and that's the end of it. But it's becoming a platform-mediated business, right, where there are many players. There's content providers, search engine for reset providers, software, application, network infrastructure. It's a much more complex ecosystem. There's an interesting question there with respect to whether or not the search piece of that puzzle, which is what I'm presuming Google would hope to provide, is in fact going to be the piece that captures the value. And so as Google thinks about that, my hope is that they're giving due consideration to the strategic uncertainty, not merely the growth opportunity that moving into a new space represents. Michael, would you give us some examples that would illustrate the strategy paradox for our listeners? Sure. Um, chapter two of the book is an extended uh, explanation of uh, two product introduction failures at Sony, um, the, the, uh, the Betamax and the Minidisc. Um, and I chose Sony not because they're an icon of failure, and right? I chose Sony because, in fact, they're an enormously successful company and, and are to be admired for many, many reasons. You know, this, this is not a place that's been run by knuckleheads for the last 50 years. And yet, they still have um, on their hands two of, the, uh, two of the most notable failures in consumer electronics. And that's not because they're dumb or because they don't know what they're doing. It's because their approach to strategy is in fact perfectly consistent with the prescriptions of great strategy. So the Betamax, for instance, was a device that was designed to be the leading edge technology that was, had a laser-like focus on a very particular application. Right? It was designed to provide time shifting of television programs, which in 1974 was a revolution. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, such a revolution that uh, um, all of the major um, television production studios, in fact, had launched a class action suit in order to have Betamax declared an illegal device because they were afraid of piracy. 
and, uh, and and Sony delivered on its promise. They delivered the best technology that did that job better than anything else. Uh, they were undone, unfortunately for them, by strategic uncertainty. It turned out that not all the studios were uh, were willing to kind of hold ranks, and so Fox eventually made movies available for rent, and that opened the floodgate, and all the studios followed suit. And in the end, it turned out that movie viewing at home was the killer application. But by the time it became clear that this was, in fact, where Sony should have focused its efforts, they'd spent 10 years optimizing the device to do something else, whether competitors had, in fact, guessed right. So as a consequence, Sony committed to a perfectly reasonable strategy, one that in fact held out the promise of total market dominance. But unfortunately for them, the luck broke the other way. And so as a result, they failed. And in fact, this is in fact is something that, I, that I, we didn't touch on earlier. Great strategy is not a guarantee of success. The strategy paradox is the fact that great strategies can in fact be the cause of total failure. Right. If, Mike, if, if, if Sony had taken a more middle-of-the-road, timid, one-step-at-a-time approach, they, in fact, might have been able to adapt their strategy and remain alive in the market, but they never would have had the opportunity of, complete, of total success, of complete domination. Right. So the possibility of great success is what exposes you to a systematically higher risk of total failure. So there's an example of, of, uh, of a company that has succumbed to the strategy paradox, not because they did anything wrong, but precisely because they did everything right. That's why we call it a paradox. Now, how does this paradox apply to small companies? Sure, I think that's a, a fair question. I, I think, first of all, the trade-off between risk and return is kind of one of those iron laws. It absolutely applies. We can do things to attenuate it and mitigate it, but we can't make it completely go away. Uh, and so small companies are subject to the desire to win big, which requires significant commitment, but then they're exposed to the risk that accompanies that commitment. <coughs> Pardon me. And so as a consequence, um, small companies, like large companies, may well have a need to manage strategic uncertainty. There is a question, of course, as to whether or not they have the resources to actually do it. So if you really are Hewlett and Packard in a garage with one oscilloscope to, sp to sell, then you don't need all of this overhead. Right, the notion of corporate offices and uh, and different operating divisions and create, it's just not relevant. Right? You, you basically have to step up to the plate, take your best cut at the ball, and hope you hit it. Because uh, then you get to pay your mom the rent on the garage, right? But it doesn't take long before organizations are sufficiently complex and are thinking sufficiently seriously about the long term that some of these principles actually start to come into play. Um, we've worked with companies that have been as small as 100 million in, in revenue. Now that's not small in absolute terms, I understand, but you don't need to be Microsoft or Johnson & Johnson or AT&T to think about and to apply these principles um, to real benefit. So you have two widely acclaimed books now, The Innovator Solution and The Strategy Paradox. How do these two connect? Um, my mother certainly thinks they're widely acclaimed, so <laughs> I hope everyone else agrees. Um, the, strategy, the, the Innovator Solution, I had the, the, the privilege to co-author that with Clay Christensen. Uh, Clayton is, the, is a professor at the Harvard Business School, and his first book in 97, The Innovator's Dilemma, really introduced the world to the notion of uh, disruptive innovation. The Innovator's Solution, as the follow-up to that, was an attempt to describe how companies could actually, as the title might suggest, solve the dilemma that Clayton identified uh, in, in his first book. As a consequence, I see the innovator solution as essentially an attempt to describe how companies can create new growth, how they can generate returns. Um, but of course, there are two sides to that coin. Right? There are no returns without risk, and until we fully understand all the mechanics of success in business, which is not something I expect us to figure out anytime soon, there will remain material uncertainty, and strategic uncertainty in particular. And so the strategy paradox is an attempt to look at the other side of that coin. Uh, it is an attempt to really unpack strategic uncertainty, an attempt to manage and cope and exploit that strategic uncertainty uh, when our ability to predict and control the future essentially runs out of steam. So uh, I think of the world in terms of the blue book, which is the innovator solution, and the red book, which is the strategy paradox. So uh, with a red book and a blue book, no matter what side of the political divide you're on, I've got you covered. Very nice. So you do work for Deloitte, a major consulting firm. Do you think that most consulting firms are innovative themselves? Well, most is an interesting question. Um, certainly the one I'm most familiar with, uh, I'm inclined to think, uh, does its best to be innovative in ways that are valuable to its clients. Um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the key distinctions that we draw in the innovator solution, and as a consequence the way I tend to look at the question of innovation, is in terms of the difference between sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. 
doing more and better things for your most important clients. And I think any any organization that has uh, has a track record of uh, success and growth, as Deloitte has do several other consulting firms, can lay claim to being very good at sustaining innovation, you know, doing those things better that our existing customers want us to do better. Disruptive innovation is a different story. Disruptive innovation is, in many instances, the the seeds of new growth. But it's also important not to get confused. The vast majority of what all companies do is sustaining innovation, and that's as it should be. Disruptive innovation is something that most organizations do uh, and don't need to do uh, on, on a recurring basis every six or 12 months. It's something that comes along. It's, it's a secular sort of event. And, uh, and the opportunity for genuinely disruptive innovation in management consulting is something that uh, we and other firms have been looking at, I think, for a while. And uh, so far, I don't think any of us has cracked it. What do you want your readers to take away from reading this book, The Strategy Paradox? Sure. Well, there are uh, a number of uh, taglines that I hope uh, people will walk away with. We mentioned some of them already. This notion of requisite uncertainty as a design principle, strategic flexibility as a toolkit for managing uncertainty. Um, but one of the uh, uh, one of the concepts that I hope catches on is the idea that corporate strategy is something that is fundamentally distinct from competitive strategy, and that it adds value in a, in a deeply different way. When we tend to talk about strategy, we're almost implicitly talking about competitive strategy, the way in which organizations create and capture value in a specific product market. When we talk about corporate strategy, we tend to get a little confused. We kind of lose sight of what it is we're talking about anymore. Is, is, is the corporate office there to set performance targets? Is it there to capture synergies? Uh, most organizations, as nearly as I can tell, take what I'll call a Hippocratic Oath of corporate management, which is first do no harm. Right, essentially just giving to the operating divisions total autonomy as if somehow that were a virtue. And I think that's actually an abdication of the ways in which the corporate office may actually be able to genuinely add value. Not necessarily by simply improving the competitive position of the operating businesses, That's who, who would argue with that, of course, but rather by actively managing the strategic uncertainty that the operating divisions face. There are, after all, in my view, two ways to create value. You can drive revenue and profits, or you can reduce risk. And if you reduce risk, you actually increase the value of the organization. So separating corporate from competitive strategy on, uh, along the lines of the degree of strategic uncertainty you face and the way in which you manage it is, I think, a, a potential step forward in the, in the art and science of management. So just out of curiosity, how long did it take you to write a book like this? Well, it um, took me about seven and a half months to write the manuscript and it took me 10 years to figure out what I wanted to write. <laughs> so uh, the book, in many senses, really is what my doctoral thesis grew up to become. Uh, if you read my doctoral thesis, which is not something I would recommend, frankly, um, it's 400 pages long, and on the last three pages, I do some hand-waving about this notion of strategic uncertainty and real options. And, uh, and that three pages has essentially turned into the 300-plus pages that are the strategy paradox. Sounds wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. And um, again, we'll, we're excited to have you up on I Innovate. Thanks so much. Take care.